basically the bill that you have amends many bills like the Banks Act and other bills, Companies Act and so on, um, to, to reinforce the framework that we have. And, and before going into it, and I don't know if the presentation is up, I can't see it. Um, uh, uh, is the presentation up for honorable members? Uh, Mama, it's Alan. Um, Cindy asked out oh, there, it's on. Okay, okay. And apologies, we just made a few small changes, so it may differ slightly from what members have had. So, Chair, just to let you know who's on, and there may be others, but from the Treasury, it's myself, uh, it's Fukile Davidson, Janine Bednagiosi, um, and Langele Kabindi. And we've got colleagues from the Reserve Bank, uh, Nicola Brum, Jacques Burtis, Hendrik Nell, Sabina Mohammed, Masenia Masemole, and Pregasin Mudli. There may be other colleagues who would also join us, uh, and some of them may even join us later as we respond to comments and so on. So, Chair, just to move on, so we've got a pretty big delegation because, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and next slide. Um, I think just to provide the background, um, uh, no, the, the one before, sorry. Yeah. So, Chair, I, I thought I would just quickly go through just a bit of background for honorable members. Honorable members must uh, would would know that um, after the two thousand and eight global financial crisis, which really was a significant event, uh, it was a kind of one in hundred year event uh, when you had such a massive banking crisis in the world. Um, of course, COVID has now. Uh, you know, become a worse crisis. It's not necessarily a financial crisis. It's an economic crisis, certainly, uh, but so far not a financial crisis. But what we learned from the global financial crisis, in fact, we had almost forgotten the kind of big crash and, and problems that you had in the early 1930s, because many of us were in this room and watching it were unlikely to be around. There'll be very few people who were around and there would obviously be at least 90 plus years. Um, and even then they would have been infants. So in a sense, the world had forgotten just how bad a financial crisis is. And the entire, and though the crisis was with a US bank, um, uh, it, it quickly spread to other banks in the US it quickly spread to other banks in Europe and in other parts of the world. Uh, and, 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 and I'll come to that. And basically when you have a bank that's in trouble, it's a systemic, it, become, it can very quickly become a systemic crisis because banks themselves are interconnected. So if one major bank fails, you're gonna find all your other major banks will also fail because there may be deposits of the one bank in the other, uh, or their clients have deposits in one, loans from the other, they can't pay and so on. And in response to that crisis, um, because South African banks largely were safe and well-regulated and didn't take the risk that the US banks had taken, um, uh, we were able to um, uh, wait a bit and see what, what was happening and how other countries were responding. And let me say that, you know, up to then, uh, Chair and Honorable Members, the G20 used to only be a forum for the ministers of finance. But with the crisis in the US, uh, um, uh, heads of state uh, attend, started uh, 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 attending this forum and created a higher forum than ministers of finance. And um, since then, you've had the G20 heads of state, and their basic mission at that point was to save the world from this uh, global crisis that you that that we were seeing. And what happened was, um, uh, in South Africa, we waited. We waited till 2011, when we published a, a document which cabinet approved, called a safer financial sector to serve South Africa better. 
And, and I would still advocate that members read this. It is on our website. So cabinet adopted this policy and it basically laid the basis for setting up the Twin Peaks system where we stepped up the power of the registrar of banks and converted them into the prudential authority uh, to look at the financial health okay, uh, of, of financial institutions, uh, 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 including banks. So what they would do is they would assess, can a bank deliver on its promise that if it holds your deposit and it says you can come and collect your deposit anytime, that it can actually deliver on that promise? Can a retirement fund deliver on its promise when you retire in 30 or 40 years time that your pension will still be there and be able to pay out? So it deals with financial wellness. Um, as opposed to, we also created um, um, a market conduct regulator to protect customers because financial institutions are very powerful. No customer can fight their bank on their own unless they're very, very, very rich. Uh, and so we created a conduct, the financial sector conduct authority. We converted the old financial services board to ensure that their focus would just be our banks, not just treating their customers fairly, but also that the way they conduct their business doesn't exploit whole classes of their customers. And, and that's why I think I'm personally very excited by this conduct authority. And, you know, it's still early days, but that is the real protective mechanism for uh, financial sector customers, uh, including banking customers. Linked to that, there's a financial sector ombud system there's a tribunal. There's a whole lot of mechanisms to protect customers uh, in that bill. Um, so you can move on to the next slide. So what we did in South Africa, and, and just to bear in mind that we've got at least 10 acts of parliament, which specifically deal with the financial sector. So they apply to banks mainly, uh, uh, sorry, uh, not mainly, to others as well. but. Um, and most, of, or, except for one of these acts, they're all administered by the Minister of Finance. So you'll have a Banks Act, you'll have an uh, Insurance Act, you'll have a Collective Investment Schemes Act, you'll have the FICE Act. You've got many acts. And there's a National Credit Act, which falls under the Minister of Trade and Industry. So um, what we then did was, you know, we publish a range of papers and framework papers after 2011. And in fact, you know, we have one or two major bills still left. There's a so-called coffee bill, which is a conduct of financial institutions uh, bill, which we hope to bring to, it's been published for comment, which we hope to bring to um, uh, uh, the Standing Committee of Finance to Parliament uh, later this year. And that is, I think, after the Financial Sector Regulation Act, probably one of the major pieces of financial legislation. Um, we've also had more technical papers on the resolution framework. So coming back to the crisis, there were a whole lot of lessons that were learned about how to better deal with, with, with banking crisis, especially, and to generalize that to financial institutions. And the issue really was that because um, uh, of the financial crisis in any of the advanced economies can very quickly become an international crisis. And bear in mind that though our banks were safe, the impact of what happens in the financial sector hits the economy of that country. So the financial crisis in the US hit the US economy. It then um, uh, had a double effect on other economies because it firstly created a banking crisis in the Eurozone and it also led to um, uh, uh, the, the fact that when the US economy uh, uh, goes into a recession, it impacts on the rest of the world. And, and you have that with major economies like the US and now China and Europe. When their economies go down, it impacts on us very significantly. And what, that ha and what happened was Though our banks remain safe from the financial crisis, we still had a recession. 
and we and over one million South African lost their jobs, even though our banks were safe, our financial sector was safe. Um, uh, just to give you a sense of how wide this is, and largely because you know banking risk is different from other risks. It's linked to the sovereign risk. Your banks hold lots of government bonds, and there is what you call a doom loop. That if you have a banking crisis, it impacts on your sovereign risk, and it impacts on the fiscus, and it creates an economic crisis. Similarly, if you have an, you know, if your economy is in trouble for a prolonged period, it can lead to a banking crisis, especially if your sovereign bonds. Uh, um, ratings go down, your banking ratings go down, the cost of capital goes up. And so this doom loop is something you have to watch for. And what actually gets government to intervene, and it's called a moral hazard problem, because if you don't intervene, your problem will get worse. And, and because of that, your major banks can almost hold the country to ransom, because they can take more risks uh, uh, than they should, uh, knowing that the sovereign will come in. And I think a good example of that was the Eurozone crisis, which became a bigger crisis for those countries than even uh, the, the crisis in the US. And in fact, it was called uh, the, the pigs initial, initially. Uh, ah, someone's made a mistake there. It should be P I I G S, not P two Gs because it covered, you know, if you remember, it was Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And they started having problems in refinancing either their sovereign debt or bailing out their, their banks. And, and so these ba bank weaknesses, you know, uh, create huge costs for the government. And over the past three decades, you know, banking crises have contributed to large increases in public debt. Um, um, uh, and for that reason, you find that governments are forced to come in. It's almost like having a gun to your head. If you don't, it's going to be a worse crisis. So you're forced to come in. And generally, financial crises, if they are the cause of a recession, it takes much longer for the economy to, to, to get back to recovery. Next slide. So banking crises are uh, directly connected to a fiscal crisis. Um, and you, know, you can look at all the studies of 187, 187 banking crises. In fact, after 2008, there were lots and lots of books on the banking crisis so that at least for the next, I would guess 40 years, we'll remember the crisis and then we'll begin to forget and probably have another big one. Uh, but but that's the uh, 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 sort of crisis you have, and it has huge effect even in declines in average life expectancy, primary school enrollment, because it impacts on the economy, it impacts on poverty and income inequality, and so on. Next slide. And for that reason, chair, when you know we presented for the Twin Peaks. We used to say that you know banks are like um, almost like a nuclear risk to the economy. Just like you, you wouldn't if you've got a nuclear facility, you make sure that you monitor it intrusively, intensively. Uh, the world began to realize that banks also pose uh, obviously not the same directly in terms of death and and getting people physically sick, but in terms of the economy, its impact can be as devastating. And you therefore, two concepts came up and they are linked that there are some banks that are too big to fail. No country will allow them, can allow them to fail because as I said, it will get into a worse crisis. And they described as systemically important financial institutions. So they call SIFIs. And I think that's an important word, uh, uh, shorthand to remember what a SIFI is. It refers to a systemically important financial institution. And that just takes into account that there's a domino effect. One bank, major bank goes, you're gonna find the other banks go. 
You're going to find it impacts on other financial institutions that are related and, and the whole problem of moral hazard. And in fact, the thing that we don't like about this problem is that when there are profits to be made, uh, they obviously go to the shareholders of a bank. Okay, So your profits are definitely privatized. But when a, a major bank is in trouble, when there, are, when there are losses, then society has to take the cost. And that's the problem that we're trying to deal with and to prevent. Next slide. So the global financial crisis was certainly uh, a wake up call. And we found that it extends not just to the domestic economy, but can grow to be a global crisis. And that's why in 2009, uh, as I said, the G20 started meeting with the heads of state. Uh, and in fact, I think the first one was attended by uh, a president, former president Motlanti. He attended one of them. Uh, and I we remember that because I think Barack Obama um, uh, attended uh, that one or the one after. And what, in 2009, I think that's when he came in. And you, you, you have uh, a whole lot of uh, international initiatives. In fact, South Africa was not part of the uh, Financial Services Board, as it was called. And we, we so not uh, uh, Financial uh, Services Forum, I think it was called. Uh, it's now called, uh, it, it, it changed its name. And we, we kind of uh, became members and in these forums, we, um, uh, uh, we, we, we um, looked at all these problems. There's a whole set of initiatives came out. These were adopted uh, uh, and supported by, for example, in the Seoul Summit in 2010, and your SIFI same framework emerged. Uh, and basically, one of the big issues was that banks must do resolution planning or to have what's called a living world. So for example, in the US and, and many other countries now, most G20 countries, there's a, 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 a mandatory annual submission that if you're a major Sufi bank that you have to submit to the regulators, which kind of plans that in case you have financial problems, that you have an orderly dissolution. Um, um, uh, and, and that's what we're going to deal with today. Next slide. So again, I won't go through all of these. I think I've made these points that banks are, are, are really different, not just from other companies, but from other financial institu institutions as well. Um, they work on trust. And that's why you had problems like the Financial Stability Board, which is the problem I was talking about, which um, uh, through the G20, uh, dealt with cross-border resolution, reduction of, uh, of moral hazard. Next slide. Okay. Your legal framework for crisis intervention, uh, your deposit insurance, all of these. Um, and, and, and in South Africa, though we moved and we, we, we changed to Basel III, we, we put in a whole lot of new measures to hold capital and, and more capital by banks. Um, um, we, we, we haven't really moved on the resolution and deposit insurance framework, and we're now quite an outlier. So today's build chair will deal with those two issues. Next slide. Okay, these are just all the things that we did, the changes since 2011, aside from the document a safer financial sector. We've uh, uh, had to make lots of amendments to act, especially to the banks act. We've made a few changes, especially to deal with African bank, data, good bank, bad bank. We've had framework papers on deposit insurance. And, and I should add chair that all of these are available and uh, uh, on, on our website, but we could make it easier and perhaps um, just provide a page of all the links for all these documents so that members could uh, go through all of these documents. Next slide. Okay, so Chair, let's, uh, let me now just deal with the financial sector 
Oh, sorry. So this was the first RA Act, which gave the uh, Reserve Bank the additional mandate to oversee financial stability, to look at systemic events, and to also the the the, the governor of the SAB designates which institutions are SIFIs. Um, uh, next slide. So, Chair, these are the issues that this bill will will address. Maybe I'll ask one of our team to come in. I don't know, Lange or Bukile, do you want to come in and maybe do the slides in a bill since you've done most of the work? Lange or Bukile? Hi, Mama. I was just sort of trying to unmute myself. It's going to be, um, I, I can happily take you through the next couple of slides. Um, as I am um, managing the slides, um, I, I won't be able to, to see what's going on. So please uh, just jump in if, uh, if um, I need to stop or go back or, or, or anything like that. Okay. Um, so, as, as Momo, I think, has sort of um, taken us through um, the, the, the rationale for, for why this bill is important, um, and, and, and he very sort of eloquently um, Bukina, described... I'm not sure, but the, I can't see the slides. Is the slide up still? Then? Ah, yes, sir. Uh, let me... Uh, apologies, let me carry on sharing. If you have difficulty, I can go through it, but just try. Is that okay? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, excellent. Um, um, so, um, as I was saying, so, so, so Momo, um, just describe the, the path um, to that's taken us to where we are right now. Um, he described the central importance of financial institutions uh, um, to, to the economy more broadly and in individuals in the economy. It's, it's where people deposit their, their wages. It's how we facilitate payments. Um, and, and that is really the, the, the systemic importance of, of financial institutions. Um, banks, there's also different types of, of systemically important institutions like um, the, the JSC, um, as well as um, large insurers and asset managers, and, and all of these are basically institutions that are large enough, interconnected enough, um, and complex enough to cause a broad problem um, in, in the financial sector should they fail. Um, yeah, Momo also uh, touched on the, um, on the international work um, and, and described uh, the, the, the linkages um, that um, crises emanating from other countries can have inside of South Africa and, and vice versa um, as well. Uh, South Africa's financial system is, is central to, to our neighbors, um, specifically, particularly those who uh, are part of the common monetary area. Um, um, so so, so we, we, we not only have a, a responsibility to make sure that the financial system is safe uh, for, for our citizens, but it's any sort of disruption would, would cause a problem uh, regionally and, and probably more, more largely on, on the continent. Um, and, and that's really the reason why international coordination has, has been such a big uh, part of, of the policy journey uh, so far. Um, so what problem will we be addressing? Um, the, what, what we want to do in, in this bill is to minimize uh, recourse uh, to public funds. Uh, and this is to address the moral hazard problem that, that Momo uh, described. Um, and, and that is that in good times, it is the um, creditors and shareholders of a bank that enjoy uh, the profits. Yet in bad times, often uh, the public uh, purse has to step in and, um, and help out uh, specific groups, uh, uh, namely uh, uh, ordinary depositors. Um, so that is, that is um, and, and as outlined, the, the cost of, of these failures um, are, are obviously borne, borne by, the, by the general public. Um, so that, that's a, a big pillar of what we're trying to do. 
um, a big part of that uh, is planning for failure. Um, so very often the largest financial in, uh, institutions are very complex and have integrate ties to other financial institutions, both domestically and internationally. Um, so a big part of what the bill aims to introduce is to make uh, uh, SIFIs uh, resolvable. And, and, and that is really to, to place them and to plan uh, for their death to, uh, uh, in, in case of their failure, I'm choosing uh, death is in that term, um, uh, to ensure that they, uh, to minimize the, the, the disruption to the broader economy. Uh, to do this, the resolution framework will do four main things. Um, it will adopt what is called bail-in instead of what uh, we have used in the past, uh, which is bail-out. Um, this requires, um, or the, the, this is rather identifying a set of um, liabilities uh, on, on the bank balance sheet that are specifically designed to absorb losses and therefore take the place of any additional funds or additional funds uh, that the public uh, fiscus would otherwise have to commit to make sure that the institution remains uh, stable. The next thing is the need for complex CIFIs to plan for the possibility of failure. Uh, uh, this, is, this is resolution planning. Um, and that is to make sure that um, in, in the case of failure, there is an orderly and feasible uh, resolution. The next thing is um, the, the need for it for depositor and depositor uh, protection and recognition and the recognition of this in, in liquidation processes. Um, and that is why, as Momo said in the top of the, of, of the presentation, there will be other tweaks to um, as um, related legislation to make this possible, namely uh, the Insolvency Act and Companies Act. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, there is a need for a legal framework that goes beyond uh, ordinary curatorship and business rescue provision. And, and this is uh, due to the, the, the central nuclear uh, facility-like or systemic nature uh, of financial institutions. Um, they are uh, additional powers um, are required uh, to, to make sure uh, the policy uh, that regulators rather uh, have sufficient uh, toolkit uh, to to affect uh, the resolution of, of complex institutions. So the I'll now speak a little bit about the current legal gaps in in South Africa uh, with respect to, to resolution. Uh, so the Banks Act only provides for, for, curious, for curatorship, which is limited in scope and does not apply to non-bank financial institutions um, and, uh, and to allow for the, for the um, planning of, of their failures. And, and these are obviously the systemic important financial institutions uh, that, that we referred to earlier. In addition, the, the Companies Act provides for a business rescue uh, proceedings, uh, but does not give due regard for the nature of complexities of large, complex financial uh, institutions. Um, and, and maybe just to expand on that point, and, and, and that's because banks are, are not really like ordinary uh, businesses. They, they have what we call critical functions. Um, and those functions are, are, for instance, allowing the payment system to, to continue to operate. Um, so in part, the bill will allow for failure of a bank should that happen, but maintain its critical functions, like um, allowing um, payments to be made or customers to still meet uh, their, their, um, their obligations uh, to, to pay rent, uh, to pay for uh, uh, transport, school fees, uh, things like that. So that's the... That's the, the, the element that that seeks to address. The Insolvency Act only applies to liquidation proceedings, um, but does not recognize uh, depositor as a preferred uh, um, creditor. Um, so uh, this was the, the, the main thrust of the 2015 um, um, Banks, uh, Banks Act Amendment Bill. Um, we then, uh, try to clarify the creditor hierarchy to ensure 
that uh, we would we, um, there was sufficient um, liabilities um, available uh, for us to protect um, uh, depositors uh, in part. Uh, so the the proposal that that is now uh, in front of you will will seek to to formalize this um, and 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 and, and um, entrench this in in the law. Um, in addition, there's no pre-identified resolution authority with commensurate powers and functions to deal with group-wide resolution for, for financial conglomerates. Uh, in, South in South Africa, uh, banks are usually part of complex financial conglomerates uh, made up of insurers, asset managers, uh, banks, uh, and, and banks themselves. Um, right now, we don't have any powers to be able to deal with with the, the, the complex um, financial conglomerates and their and the relationship that these companies have with, with each other uh, within conglomerate structures, um, again, this was a problem that we encountered with in African Bank. Um, there, the other parts of that conglomerate happened to be uh, a furniture business uh, in in the form of uh, Ellerines, I I believe, um, but the the linkages between these two companies created problems uh, uh, for us in, when we tried to resolve the institution. And this bill uh, will provide powers and measures and, and tools rather uh, for the regulators to be able to, to resolve um, financial conglomerates. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, there's a recognition that there's just a fragmentation in the law and there needs to be alignment and cooperation provisions between uh, regulators. In particular, this relates to the prudential authority within, within the Reserve Bank, uh, the Reserve Bank itself. Uh, but not only that, there are uh, tools that would allow facilitation of resolution that reside in other um, regulators uh, that the, that uh, MoMA had had described earlier as part of the Twin Peaks framework, uh, uh, namely the um, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. Um, to proceed, so there are no legal provisions for resolutions planning for banks uh, currently, um, or systemically important non-bank financial financial institutions and their holding companies. Um, I touched on this earlier. Um, uh, bailouts are based on a case-by-case -case basis and not in accordance to the uniform standard uh, or principle defined in law. Um, this this is what the this is another feature that the the, the bill will introduce. Um, I've also touched on this that there's a lack of deposit protection in resolution and liquidation. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, that South Africa does not have an explicit privately funded deposit insurance scheme. And, and Momo touched on, touched on this earlier, um, but an important feature of the of the deposit insurance scheme is that it will be private funded, a, sh a sort of um, a forced savings mechanism for the financial sector or, or specifically banks uh, in in case um, we need uh, to to compensate uh, depositors in in the event of uh, of failure. I'm not just going to sort of just take you through um, the sort of key objectives uh, um, schematically of, of the uh, of the bill, uh, and there are sort of four main pillars. Um, the first is to provide a, a framework for the resolution of banks and non-banks and CIFIs. Uh, the second is to designate the Reserve Bank as the resolution authority with commensurate powers, and and some of those I've, I've described. Uh, the third pillar is the establishment of this deposit insurance fund and cooperation. Um, and the last pillar is a creation of a creditor hierarchy to, to ensure depositors are protected, are further protected in liquidation. And th this adds another layer of, of, uh, of protection in addition to, to the deposit insurance. So the deposit insurance scheme um, allows for the compensation um, of depositors. Um, uh, through this sort of forced saving mechanism, and then their their preference in liquidation um, allows them um, beyond the the sort of coverage amount uh, to to benefit uh, from to, to essentially stand first in line uh, 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 for the parts of the bank um, that are salvaged um, in in liquidation. 
Um, I'm just going to now briefly uh, describe the, the key elements of, of the bill. Um, so clause 1 to 15, these are various technical amendments, uh, and this will include um, insolvency amendments to the over-the-counter over um, derivatives. Um, clause 51 um, is, is, is the, the meat of the of the bill that we're presenting um, today. Um, and, and those are the resolution elements that we've that MoMA has described, as well as, as, well as the introduction of the deposit insurance uh, um, aspects, uh, which, which we've also described. Um, and then lastly, um, clause 52 to 61 um, are the long title amendments and, and the general amendments. <laughs> So, what are the the key proposals? And when and we've we've kind of gone through this um, uh, before, and Momo has has kind of alluded to this as 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 he provided a history and the rationale for the bill. Um, but I'll, I'll perhaps it's worthwhile just going through them again. Um, so the bill aims to enhance the Reserve Bank's um, financial stability mandate and expand its objectives for depositor uh, protection. Secondly. Um, uh, the scope of application will be for all banks. Um, uh, we have designated all banks as systemically uh, important. Um, and, and this is because even small banks um, that don't have large amounts of customers uh, are closely linked and interconnected uh, to other banks. And confidence problems in a small bank can easily spill over to larger banks. It's sort of uh, an analogy that we, we, we often use is, is that um, it, it, it addresses a fire at, um, even though there is no fire in, in, in your house, uh, you still have an interest in ensuring that the fire at your neighbor's house is put out in case it spreads to your house. Um, in addition, sort of systemically important non-bank financial institutions and holding companies will also be included in scope. Stabilization powers are uh, to include bail-in, transfer of assets and liabilities, as well as creation of uh, bridge institutions. These are all tools that uh, have been deployed um, in, in some form previously uh, in other resolutions, including an African bank, uh, but the proposals here seem to uh, well, seek to uh, make these clearer uh, and um, um, and and apply them more more consistently. Uh, in addition, we will establish the resolution authority, uh, which will be the res within the reserve bank or the, um, the reserve bank, uh, and they will be responsible for the development of resolution plans as well as designating. Um, um, CIFIs. Uh, lastly, there will be safeguards to include a new proposed creditor hierarchy, and we will go this in. We'll go into this in more detail in slide 15. Um, uh, and and this um, uh, an important um, um, a creditor um, uh, protecting uh, tool in this is is a no creditor worse off principle, which. Uh, we will go into as well, I think, in, in more detail when we when we get into the credit hierarchy slides. All right. So the I'll just go through the the resolution framework and 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 what it seeks to do. And and I've and and this has largely been covered in in the, in the previous slide. Um, but I'll also go through the specific uh, powers and functions uh, that the Reserve Bank have. Um, I'll perhaps go, go through that first, um, as, as I've, I've broadly covered the, the, the framework. So the, uh, the powers and functions of, uh, of the Reserve Bank are, are uh, five main ones, and the, the first is the power to remove and replace management and recover monies from those uh, responsible for, for the, uh, the failure. Um, this includes um, where um, a measure to sort of reduce some of the moral hazard that we described earlier. Uh, so for management of a financial institution or a bank, uh, very often they have an incentive uh, to create as much uh, money for their shareholders as, as possible. And, and this usually requires taking on more and more risk. 
but clearly the more risk uh, a bank takes, the more likely it is that they will that this will lead to failure and that um, the, um, the the funds of, of ordinary depositors will, will be placed um, at risk. Um, and and um, to, to reduce this moral hazard, um, um, or, or rather um, uh, a part of this moral hazard is that uh, the, the staff or senior management of bad financial institutions receive large bonuses and incentives to uh, to increase the the, the profits of of, um, of financial institutions, um, and so there will be a, a power included in in the framework that will allow uh, a clawback of bonuses paid where executives have taken on excessive risks, which in part or um, or completely led to the uh, to the failure of the financial institution. Uh, secondly, there's a power to terminate, assign uh, contractual agreements, and this is really to provide financial institutions with with the space to uh, to um, uh, uh, to identify critical functions and and to resolve a financial institution to, a financial institution in an orderly manner. Uh, third. Uh, there's an appointment of resolution uh, practitioners uh, with delegated powers, uh, and this is largely akin to, to the, the current curatorship powers uh, that exists in, in the Banks Act. But of course, uh, as we said earlier, that these will be extended beyond just, uh, just uh, to banks, but also to, to broader, uh, to, to other designated CIFIs. Uh, fourthly, um, the power to establish bridge institutions and transfer selected assets and liabilities. Um, and this really allows uh, the, the preservation of critical functions uh, that I described earlier. Uh, and lastly, power to take in uh, bail in action while respecting the hierarchy of claims and liquidation. Um, like I said, I've, I've, I've gone through the resolution framework, but, but, but uh, very quickly, this is just maintaining financial stability, deposit protection, uh, allowing for an orderly resolution of designated financial institutions, uh, management of affairs of a designated institution, uh, ensuring critical functions uh, of designated institutions continue, um, resolution planning, and uh, empowering the minister to place a designated institution uh, in resolution, which is which is uh, currently the case for banks, but again, or will be extended to um, to uh, other cities. Okay, I'm just going to skip through to the um, the changes or the proposed changes to the creditor hierarchy. Currently, we have three levels, uh, three creditor uh, classes um, uh, for for banks. Uh, these are unsecured creditors, and in and in there, uh, they are um, a, a bunch of other creditors, but also ordinary depositors. Above them, there are preferred creditors. And then above them still are secured creditors whose um, uh, loans are, are backed by specific assets or ring fence um, by specific assets on, on bank balance sheets. Um, clearly in, in the current formulation, uh, if, if a financial institution or bank had to be resolved, um, we could not differentiate between, the, between ordinary depositors um, and a whole host of other unsecured um, uh, creditors in law. And what that means practically is that um, the ordinary depositors are, occupy the same place in the queue to be compensated um, as all these other creditors and that that place in the queue, as you can see, is somewhere near the bottom. So the bill proposes to to um, to have additional um, layers of uh, of the creditor hierarchy, and in doing so, explicitly prefer depositors, uh, moving them um, significantly further up in the queue uh, to be compensated in the event of the failure, the event of a failure uh, of a financial institution. The new proposed um, creditor hierarchy um, has at the bottom um, a class of uh, regulatory debt instruments. Um, and these um, instruments will 
be the ones to absorb losses first. Above that, we will have what we call um, uh, first loss or what we term first loss additional capital instruments. Uh, and this is a, a sort of additional buffer uh, to, to further um, ensure that um, that there are um, that, that the, the the creditors higher up are, are further protected, and then we have this unsecured um, uh, class of, of creditors um, in um, that, that you that you see on the on the right hand side um, in, in the current uh, formulation, um, and then we have um, covered deposits. Um, uh, that, that we will describe earlier, and this is um, the ordinary ordinary depositors money, essentially. Um, and then, um, similar to, to the to the current formulation, we have um, preferred and and secured. Um, we we can take additional specific questions um, about the hierarchy um, uh, later if, if members have have any questions. Um, so what is the policy rationale for the new creditor hierarchy? As, as I've sort of alluded to, the current SA creditor hierarchy does not recognize the distinction between ordinary depositors using banks for transactions and informed creditors uh, and deposit making um, and um, that uh, more sophisticated um, financial institutions placed with, within banks making, seeking to make uh, an, an investment return. Uh, second, there's a need to align uh, the bail-in sequence uh, for, for creditor losses um, and and this is the uh, the the tool uh, that that allows for for creditors to absorb losses um, or for uh, the resolution authority to impose losses on on creditors uh, rather than um, uh, al uh, allowing or rather than having recourse to to the fiscus um, third, bail-in together with the creditor hierarchy should allow for an ordinary resolution and, if necessary, uh, winding up of SIF fees. Um, uh, fourthly, creditor hierarchy gives uh, due regard to sophisticated creditors, um, uh, allowing uh, um, those who have a more sophisticated understanding or those that are able to exert uh, more discipline on the risk appetite of a financial institution, and these are larger institutional investors, um, uh, as opposed to, to ordinary depositors who, who are creditors, but don't have the same ability uh, to question the risk appetite or activities uh, of, of, of the management of, of a bank. If we don't have too many more slides, and, and uh, I'll, I'll try to get through this last bit quickly, but I'm just mindful of the time. Um, uh, so the, the, um, just, just to continue on the, on the policy rationale for the creditor hierarchy, uh, a definitive creditor, definitive creditor hierarchy will ensure transparency and avoid uh, confusion. Um, the type of confusion we had uh, when we tried to resolve African Bank and had to hastily um, through um, a bunch of clarifying uh, amendments in, in 2015. Um, a preferred versus ordinary creditors uh, and those who bear the first loss, which in turn will lead to the avoidance of under or over pricing of risk. Um, and then lastly, the need to align as a creditor hierarchy uh, to international standards. In summary, the, the, there are four proposals. Um, and these are first, secured and preferred creditors to retain their current ranking. The second, de for depositor preference of covered depositors up to the coverage level of 100,000 rands uh, per, per customer, um, per bank. Uh, third, unsecured creditors currently recognized in insolvency to rank below current uh, to, to rank below covered depositors. And lastly, for the introduction of this extra loss absorbing class of, of creditor instruments, uh, FLAC, uh, these instruments are specifically identified as loss absorbing uh, after regulatory capital. Uh, fifth, regulatory capital requirements are designed to bear 
going concern losses. Um, lessons from the previous bank failure show that regulatory capital may be insufficient by the time SIFI enters resolution. Additional requirements for large financial institutions to hold instruments over and above regulatory capital uh, for loss absorbing, uh, for, for loss absorption during resolution. Um, and lastly, regulatory capital has to be available to absorb shocks and losses during normal times and prevent failure. If there's any regulatory capital left when a bank fails, the creditor hierarchy should ensure that the instruments identified as regulatory capital are the first in line to suffer uh, losses in the event of failure. I'm now going to spend some time going through the features of the of a, a really important innovation that the bill seeks to introduce. Um, as Momo described earlier, uh, I think South Africa is the only country amongst current G20 members not to have uh, a deposit insurance, an explicit deposit insurance scheme in place. It was ourselves in Saudi Arabia. I believe Saudi Arabia have introduced this now. Um, so this has been long overdue. It is it is an innovation that that, that seeks to protect the most vulnerable uh, creditors uh, in a bank. Uh, these are ordinary depositors uh, who, like I said earlier, also have the the least ability to exercise discipline over how a bank behaves and the risk a bank takes and the, the risk a bank takes. Um, um, uh, and, and, and I think, um, and maybe just to underscore, um, this is, uh, we, we all sort of witnessed the, 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 the anxiety um, uh, that ordinary depositors had uh, in, in the failure of, uh, in our most recent bank failure, which was, which was VBS. These were long lines of, of ordinary investors, of ordinary depositors rather, who had placed their deposit in, that, in, in, in the bank um, expecting the bank to to safeguard their their deposits, um, and, and these are the, the the hard sort of earned deposits of, of ordinary investors and, and of ordinary depositors rather. Excuse me. Um, and and this 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 innovation seeks to um, seeks to protect um, um, these depositors. <clears throat> Um, so I'll just go through the advantages um, of the uh, of the deposit insurance scheme and, and what the, the the insurance scheme aims to do. Um, it aims to eliminate um, the risk of deposit losing funds uh, that deprive them of their of their livelihoods. Second, it will it'll promote uh, com competition of smaller banks. Um, and the way it'll do this is that the the perceived increase uh, safety of a big bank uh, will be uh, will be reduced because all all banks, regardless of their size, um, will have the same amount of uh, protection or provide the same amount of protection for ordinary depositors. Thirdly, it'll improve confidence and reduce risks of a bank run during a crisis, uh, and 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 this we've we've seen. So th this is to reduce that. Uh, the, the problems of, 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 of panic and, and long lines of uh, that that happen when whenever uh, people uh, hear that the, there may be trouble at their bank, uh, clearly the rational thing to do is to go to that to go to your bank and try to withdraw uh, all your money. This this will be uh, um, a confidence measure that 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 um, that will allow ordinary depositors to understand that no matter what, up to the coverage level. Uh, of 100,000 rands, uh, which, by the way, is is uh, close to um, uh, something like um, uh, 95 or, or maybe slightly less uh, percent of of average balances at at a bank. Um, that 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 deposit that those deposit funds are are safe. I um I can get you the, the exact sort of coverage um, amount uh, later if if. Uh, if members want to know that. Uh, fourthly, uh, it, uh, it ensures continued access to funds during a failure. Um, even if a bank fails, people have ongoing um, obligations. They have to pay for uh, rent, school fees, cars, etc. So this will allow um, those payments to, to continue even in the event of a bank failure. 
Uh, it also minimizes the risk of contagion. Uh, it, it enhances South Africa's market integrity, which in turn in ensures uh, investor confidence. Um, it, it will allow smaller banks' crises to be better managed uh, with minimal disruption. Um, very importantly, it will protect the fiscus. Um, the fiscus has had to bail out um, um, depositors in um, almost in, in, in certainly the last bank failure, VBS, and the one before that, African Bank, um, and, and ones before that as well. So this, it, this will protect the fiscus from that. Um, so, it'll put uh, the cost. Uh, Mr. Davidson, how far are you with your presentation? Remember, we have got three bills to process today, and by 12, we should be done. I know the ANC has got a caucus around to one. So if you can move faster towards conclusion. Chair, we're almost um, done. Yes, Chair. So, and, and, uh, um, so move faster. Um, yeah, speak to, you, you speak to the slides because we have received the presentation before. And then during okay. the discussions, members will raise questions for clarity and make comments so that we have okay. enough opportunity for the other two bills to be presented. Okay. Uh, certainly, but, certainly, Chair. Um, I, I, I will go through the, the next two slides in, in a little bit of detail and then um, and then rush along because these next two slides are, are, are critical. Um, I will just go through the, the structural features of the, the deposit insurance scheme. Um, it is to be housed in the Reserve Bank. Um, it's to be a, a subsidiary of, of the Reserve Bank. The, members, the membership of the uh, deposit insurance um, scheme are to be registered licensed banks or registered licensed banks. Um, and the funds to consist of premiums collected, uh, deposits by bank and, and investment uh, returns of these items. Um, uh, so so the, the, the funding level is sort of threefold. It's a levy, a premium, and a um, provisional uh, liquidity line uh, to the deposit insurance uh, scheme. Um, the this, this slides go, goes into the, the sort of um, the, the specifics of, of the, the, uh, the funding of, of the deposit insurance. I won't spend too much time on this as, as members have the slides. Um, uh, it, there are uh, three very important design features it will establish uh, information requirements. In other words, it'll uh, have a single customer view. So whether uh, just whether a customer has multiple accounts, it will consolidate these accounts and then provide coverage uh, to a customer on, on an aggregated basis. Uh, it will limit support for, um, it will provide limited support, rather, for open resolution strategies. In other words, there may be circumstances where it is better, it is less costly uh, um, for uh, the res for the um, deposit insurance to provide um, an amount of funds uh, up to what it would have paid out um, and to to keep the institution going, um, and so it'll allow for, for that um, ability. Uh, and lastly, there's an emergency liquidity facility, which is to be provided um, by the Reserve Bank as a backstop in the event of insufficient funding. Um, so, Chair, that, that, that brings us to the, uh, to, to the conclusion of the, of the presentation. Um, uh, just uh, in, in summary, um, in 2008's financial strike crisis exposed the regulatory gaps in, in global uh, uh, financial markets, and but especially for banks, which operate in a, on a cross-border basis. Um, and the moment described this doom loop. Um, large financial institutions, uh, which are systemically important and deemed too big to fail, require additional tools uh, for uh, regulators to resolve um, cleanly um, and, and not to spill over into the broader economy. Uh, the regulatory framework requires a legal process that entails early intervention, crisis management, uh, and crisis planning for an ordinary wind down. The bill introduces that. 2009, South Africa undertook to adopt a uh, resolution uh, framework in line with G20 um, uh, peers. Um, what is important is that other countries deem our uh, regulatory system to be uh, um, equally safe 
or they will apply additionally stringent um, requirements on South African banks operating as counterparts uh, because of, 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 of inadequacies in, in, in our system. So this reduces the, the, the need for that. Um, and, and lastly, um, we are taking on lessons that we had learned from African Bank and VBS um, and, uh, and recognizing the need for additional powers uh, and tools uh, to intervene. Um, and we are explicitly providing for a privately funded deposit insurance scheme for vulnerable deposits. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's, uh, that's it. Thank you, Chair. We're done. Okay. Uh, thanks, Treasury, for the presentation. Uh, honorable members, it's time for clarity seeking questions and uh, comments. Uh, let me see if there are members in the platform who would like to uh, ask clarity seeking questions and make comments. Uh, Alan, who you will assist me from your side. Um, Chair, for now, there is Dr. George and Mr. Hill Lewis. And then, yeah, Honorable Murolo. Uh, Dr. George. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for the presentation. Um, on the deposit protection, I do think it's a good idea because, you know, many other jurisdictions also do that. Um, it sounds to me as if it is basically an insurance type scheme, because what I'm hearing is that the, the private sector or the banking or the loaning institutions will pay for this. Um, so I think it sounds like basically an insurance policy that gets paid pre by premiums. Um, and then it's if it's managed by the Reserve Bank, um, the question is, what happens if, I mean, who underwrites that fund then? So let's say there was some kind of catastrophic, catastrophic event, which we hope wouldn't happen, but let's say it did, and there was insurance, which is a good thing, but there wasn't enough money in that fund. Who would actually underwrite it? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. George. Uh, Honorable A. Lewis. Thank you very much to the team. Uh, it was a really excellent presentation and very comprehensive uh, and uh, really puts one's mind at ease that this is a, an excellent initiative and a step in the right direction for South African depositors. Uh, it may have been covered in the presentation, but I, but uh, it was there were quite a lot of slides and it was quite long. But could you just let me know what the maximum coverage offered would be uh, or the maximum covered losses? Thank you. Thanks, Honorable Lewis. Honorable Murolo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Let me also appreciate uh, the, the efforts that were put into drafting uh, this bill. Just a few questions, Chair. Um, my first concern is whether could this bill not be uh, counterproductive uh, in a sense that financial services institution, knowing that uh, they have an insurance fallback uh, position or other act, uh, behave in a more risky or uh, unethical uh, manner. The, the, the second question is, can a practical example be given? For instance, if a depositor had a deposit of 100,000, what would be the insurance cost of that deposit? Um, and the, the, the third question is, does the introduction of a uh, this depositor levy not erode potential growth a, a depositor would have had. Um, well, maybe the, the last one, Chair, and, and, and I am also mindful of the fact that I had connectivity issues earlier, and this question uh, would have been uh, quite, uh, I mean, quite succinctly dealt with. Uh, let's say if the funding structure is that the members fund the, a percentage of the insurance fund, would the bank not simply pass on the cost of this insurance on all their customers? Thank you very much. Thanks. Let me also ask a question, uh, Mr. Momo and uh, Davidson. 
I see in your presentation, you say in 2019, uh, the South African Reserve Bank published a discussion paper on uh, called Ending Too Big to Fail, South Africa's intended approach to bank resolutions. And uh, you continue and say that uh, there are major banks which are too big to fail and you uh, acronym it as TBTF. And this is why banks are often compared to nuclear facilities and described as a systemically important financial institutions. Are you implying that uh, you will go all out and support very big banks and uh, neglect small ones because they are small that they can fail? Uh, only those which are too big uh, should not be allowed to fail. Does this give us an impression that uh, is a reason why government uh, is not seen to be interested in assisting uh, uh, VBS. So banks like VBS will be allowed to collapse. You get net bank to pay off uh, the clients, Itala and others. This, I'm not comfortable with this kind of a statement in a, a presentation by government and it should go to, 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 to parliament. Uh, I, I, I'm not, because what you are saying is that the government will go all out and protect uh, monopolies. And those which are very small can look for themselves and even if they are fail, uh, no, it's not a problem. Uh, give us the context of why did you write this thing in a, in a presentation uh, to us as, a, as parliament? Uh, over to you, um, Treasurer and, uh, Net and uh, Reserve Bank. No, thank you, Chair. And, and Chair, I think the questions are actually excellent questions uh, because I think those are precisely the issues that we worry about. I mean, maybe just to explain and to start with Honorable Maralong's question, uh, you know, the, the, and, and this is a dilemma in every country, Chair, that the, the, you, you get a few banks that are systemic. Now, there'll be the obvious big four, big five, et cetera. But frankly, we found even a bank like African Bank pose, uh, 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 you know, systemic problems when we had the problem, even though at the time, perhaps one would have thought they wouldn't. So, the, so it, it, it does cover quite a few banks. And I think, you know, I just want to explain because I think in our explanation, we didn't explain what, what model hazard means. Model hazard means, for those members who may not know, that uh, uh, a bank starts taking risks. In fact, more risks uh, hoping and or, or if they knew that if government's going to come in and bail them out, they will take more risks than they should. Because, and, and in a sense, they're gambling, it's a casino. So they take huge risks. And if their risks prove to be uh, uh, work, they make a hell of a lot of money. And of course, the way the banking sector operate, they get big bonuses um, uh, for, the, for, for management. If they fail, they then know that they got a gun to government's head and government will be forced to bail out because you don't want the economy to go into meltdown and the impact will be much worse on the poor. And, and that's why we say that the way the system, effectively any banking system, uh, you know, the, your, your profits are and, and bonuses are privatized, but your failures are socialized because the state is forced to come in. Um, so, Yes, in order to prevent them from taking more risky bets, that's why, in fact, the, the words we didn't use in our presentation is the, from the G, all the G20 countries recognize that banks must be regulated, and these are their words, intrusively, intensively, and more effectively. Uh, so unlike other companies, I mean, the the Prudential Authority, for example, would go into their books. They would thoroughly examine 
their, their business model. They would make sure that all their directors and top staff are fit and proper. They've got to also meet with anti money laundering um, uh, laws, which, which are quite draconian and rightly so. So you, in the first instance, when there's a banking failure, yes, the big question is, are the regulators doing their job? Uh, and every time there's a failure, we tend, we always have some form of inquiry uh, um, to, you know, with an independent person to say, where was the fault? Was obviously the fault is with the institution, but were the regulators sleeping or not? And so to prevent moral hazard, you've got to make sure that we have quite intensive uh, and competent regulators in place. Uh, so that's the only way that you can mitigate the risky behavior. The, the problem is even without uh, this legislation, that risky behavior is there. All this law does is to try and regulate it and reduce the risk to the fiscus. And so by having the insurance, everyone pays. So Honorable John, the, the, the question on this is that uh, obviously, when they start off, the fund will be small. So you hope that there's no financial crisis for a few years and you have a huge buildup. The bigger you, fund you have, the more you can uh, uh, intervene and save depositors when there is a bank crisis. That we will have more bank crisis, that will happen. Okay, You can't stop them. But to make sure that we are better prepared, if you look at the bank bailing and Ukile can explain that better than I, you'll see that all the mechanisms that there are to put that in place. And then honorable chair, to your question, uh, at the moment, we haven't bailed out any banks, uh, uh, whether they're big or small. And all banks, when they get into trouble, they go into curatorship. Of course, the problems, and so in the case of African Bank, we were able to and, and you've got to kind of ride out the storm because banking is about trust. You have problems. Everybody runs out. Everybody wants their money. Once you try and you manage to stabilize and have a guarantee on, on 100,000 and say for each depositor, uh, you find that people start coming back to that bank. Uh, um, um, in the case of BBS, it wasn't that therefore government didn't want to save it. The problem was when we put it into creatorship, the aim was to save the bank. And then, of course, we found out the extent of fraud and the fact that there were actually no funds uh, uh, in that bank. And so it had to go into uh, liquidation and so on. So, and, and, and when, when a bank is in trouble, you hope that you have uh, other. Uh, sort of banks or other shareholders who uh, potential sh or, or, or investors who come in to buy that bank. And in fact, in that case, uh, I mean, people may put in bid, but they also have to pass a fit and proper test. And the issue with banking is that you can't borrow funds from another bank to buy a bank. You're largely, your, your major, uh, because that creates more risk to the banking system you actually have to be quite rich to own a bank and to have the capital uh, on hand, a lot of the capital. Otherwise, the banking doesn't work. And that's not a South Africa specific problem. I mean, this whole problem of moral hazard of bigger banks posing more risk is an international problem. And it's a dilemma because banks obviously do play an important role in the economy. And yes, if we had, we'd prefer to have more competition and many more smaller banks. But in a sense, given where we are, and, and Chair, let me say, this is a problem that if you look at, for example, our, our reports done by the FSEM, uh, I mean, there's a lot of monitoring on how we regulate. The Financial Stability Board has a process to do so. The Basel process also has their own peer reviews that are done. If you look at, and, and then if you look at the IMF in their last report that was done, I mean, they showed that in our case, our financial system is more prone, to, has higher risk, 
not only because there's a normal banking risk and a few companies dominate and so on, but you'll find that the same companies also dominate insurance, uh, both long-term and short-term asset management, etc. So the interconnectedness in South Africa is, is very high, high and therefore uh, the risk to the system is, is even higher. So, uh, so the issue is not that we do not come in and save small banks. In fact, the de deposit insurance will actually be much better for small banks. And that's been our concern because most of the failures have been with smaller banks in recent years. And the deposit insurance system will mean that the big banks will effectively pay for an insurance fund that can be used to also save small banks. So it, 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 it reduces the risk to the fiscus and it makes it more possible to save banks. And as I said, where we can, we generally save all banks by putting them into curatorship unless there's something that, like with VBS, where the scale of the fraud just made it impossible. And literally, you might as well, I guess, it put us into a situation that, uh, uh, you know, the good got thrown out with the bad because of the depth of the problem. I think just on, um, so the issue is not to protect monopolies, but yes, all over the world, you are going to, to step in to, to protect your banks. Uh, because as I said, uh, as one John Foster said, the consequences will be too ghastly to contemplate if you, one of your major banks uh, uh, collapses, there will be economic meltdown. And, and Chair, if you want to see what happened, I mean, look at when you had this Eurozone crisis, it started even with a small country like Iceland and what it meant for Iceland and definitely in Ireland and in Greece, where you saw the link between the sovereign and the banking risk and the years of real austerity. You want to see austerity? That became austerity. A huge budget cuts. People lost their pensions. People, I mean, the hardship is dire, okay? And in fact, the only lesson you learn from a financial crisis is make sure you do everything to prevent one. And that's why, Chair, as Parliament, you must hold us and certainly the Reserve Bank and the Prudential Authority to account to make sure that they are regulating intensively so that we don't have obvious mistakes that should have been uh, picked up. I don't know if Vukile wants to add on. I, I think I've covered Honorable Hill Lewis's question. Um, and I think I've covered what the Chair has asked. But Vukile, you want to just come in with more detail? Uh, yes, Mama, thank you. Um, I, I think, and I'm just going to, um, I, I'm, I will just pass on to the Reserve Bank as well um, to speak about the, um, the cost, the cents cost per rand uh, covered. Um, but just to answer a specific question that Honorable uh, Lewis asked, the coverage amount is 100,000 rand per customer, per bank, on a single customer view basis. Um, but Hendrik or Sabiha, would you like to go through the, um, the cost of the insurance per, uh, per rand or per 100 rands um, uh, in, the, in the deposit insurance scheme? Thank you. Um... Bukile, yes, I can quickly do that and, and just respond to a number of the questions from the honorable members. Um, so is it an insurance type scheme? That's exactly what it is. Who will underwrite it in case there's not enough funds? So the funding of the scheme, the proposal is for three layers. So premiums from the banks. Secondly, there's a liquidity layer of deposits that each member bank need to, to uh, deposit with the Corporation for Deposit Insurance. And then thirdly, there's a, there's a guarantee from the SAAP, an emergency fund that the SAAP provides in case there's not sufficient funds available for a payout. Um, then the maximum covered amount, as uh, Vukule has said, is 100,000 Rand. Um, 
Um, now, how did we arrive at 100,000 Rand? Um, so it's per qualifying deposit or per bank, as Wikilia has said, and that might seem small compared uh, internationally, but remember the intention is to protect the vulnerable depositor and not corporate depositors. So the 100,000 Rand will be sufficient to cover the retail depositors. According to a survey that we've done, um, approximately 87% of qualifying depositors in South Africa have deposits of less than 10,000 Rand. Um, that would mean as you increase that amount, you add very small amounts of quali or numbers of qualifying depositors. But, um, and Sabia can maybe um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with 100,000, you are covering more than 90% of, of depositors in South Africa. On the, on the cost, um, and will the banks pass on the cost? Um, yes, uh, although we do not prescribe how banks will recover these funds from the depositors, we've estimated that the average cost per depositor um, of deposit insurance across the sector, and this is according to a 2015 survey, will be around seven rand per depositor. So fairly small, but again, to say that we're not prescribing uh, to the banks how to recover the cost. Just one final thing, I think on the model hazard, the honorable, honorable members question on, will it be contraproductive? Will it cause model hazard? We, we have limited coverage. In other words, it's not unlimited for large depositors to receive this guarantee. So in, in that sense, it, it does not cause moral hazard. Um, will it erode potential growth? Uh, we don't think so because through this scheme, we're trying to reduce the burden on banks as well. And especially the way in which the funding structure is, um, um, is, is designed. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I think we've answered all the questions. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Momo, at some stage we'll have to discuss the monopoly of uh, the financial sector, its effect. Uh, it's not something that we are thumb sucking. Uh, the big four or the big five are there, it's known. And the entry by cooperatives, uh, emerging and small players into the banking sector is made very, very, very difficult uh, by the uh, requirements from the South African Reserve Bank. We'll have to discuss the transformation of the sector. We can't only be discussing the regulations and uh, protections, and it ends there. The previously disadvantaged have to enter this sector and become uh, major players. Otherwise, it means we'll kiss uh, transformation uh, goodbye. Those who are monopolizing now will continue to be the only players. So we understand that you are bringing regulations but uh, at uh, some stage, we'll have to discuss real transformation of the financial sector. That's what we have to do. And that's the reason why we have been elected to be members of parliament, because we represent uh, women out there, the disabled and the youth, who have been disadvantaged in the past and continue to be disadvantaged by the system that we have. So it can't be business as usual. At some stage, the sector will have to be discussed and we come with a real uh, recommendations as to what needs to be done. It's, it's something that should uh, uh, occupy our agenda. Uh, let's move to the next item. Briefing by Dr. George on the pension funds amendment bill 
B30 2020. Over to you, Dr. George. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I'm just wondering how we're going to do that. I have sent my slides to Alan, so if he's going to put them up, or I could share my screen. I don't know what's best. Uh, Dr. George, I made you co-host, so you're welcome to uh, project from your side. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, is that clear? Yes. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay. All right, I've just got, yeah, okay, right. Okay, as you know, I have, um, I have uh, drafted the Pension Funds Amendment Bill. Um, right. Uh, as we know, pension funds are an important financial asset. The primary purpose of a pension fund is to provide for a member's retirement. Pension funds play a crucial role in our economy and have approximately four trillion in assets under management. We also have a strong profitable industry that is built on pension fund administration and investment of pension fund assets. Um, let me just stop for a second. Oops. I'm having a difficulty here, Chair. I apologize. Um, right, okay. Right, pension funds are already leveraged. We have the phenomenon of pension-backed home loans. Funds are not forced to offer pension-backed home loans. Trustees decide whether the fund could make this facility available. They also acknowledge that there exists a trade-off between a member being able to live now and living in retirement. That's a conversation that's been going on for a very long time. For example, there is no point in being homeless when a member has built up assets in a pension fund that can assist in providing for personal safety now. Pension funds permit this facility. Um, the trustees decide to make the facility available the way it works is that a member borrows from a financial institution to buy a home or to make home improvements and repays the loan, usually via a salary deduction. Now, given that the loan is fully secured, the member should enjoy a more favorable interest rate. Given that the loan is fully secured, the financial institution has comfort that the loan will not become a bad debt. And importantly, no withdrawal is required and pension assets remain invested. So what is the Pension Amendment Bill amending? It is amending the restriction on pension-backed loans being available solely for the purpose of purchasing or improving a home. There is no restriction on the purpose of the loan. It sets a limit of 75% of the fund value for the loan. What remains is the trustees decide if they want to offer the loan. So the, 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 um, the bill does not force a fund to offer pension-backed loans. The trustees still decide. Um, the trustees also would be able to, to decide the loan limits. That is why I set the limit at 75, because the fund could decide what it wants to make available. The financial institution would decide if they want to offer the loan. So it's basically a similar mechanism to the current, currently restricted loan. Why now? The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted long outstanding issues. The role of pension funds in the financial life of individual members, compulsory saving to pension funds, crowding out shorter term saving. This has been discussed for a long time in that Members are 
usually obligated to invest in a pension fund. And that does actually reduce the money they have available for investing elsewhere. So you have a sway towards the longer term rather than the shorter term. So that is a conversation that's been going on for quite a while. I mean, we all know the history of this, that there were mass conversions of pension funds arrangements from defined benefits to defined contributions that began in the 1980s and accelerated in the 90s. And in this process, investment risk passed from employers to members. And then from that member investment choice evolved. And then home loans expanded member choice, as does this investment, uh, this amendment. Also, obviously, not all funds are defined contribution funds. They are still defined benefit funds. But the principle underlying this bill is that members should be able to exercise a choice on whether they would be able to leverage their pension asset for their own benefit. COVID-19 pandemic further highlighted this problem, that members are resigning to access their pensions because they get into temporary difficulty, they see no other way out, and then they access their pension and have to pay tax on that withdrawal, as we know. Um, also, members facing severe current financial hardship despite owning a financial asset. How has government and or the industry responded? We all know the discussion on pension reform remains in progress, and it has been in progress for over 15 years now. And um, also, very clearly, the amendment bill has certainly stirred up a conversation. Um, I've had 346 comments received. Many submissions were in favor of the amendment. I won't go into the detail of those. Some industry bodies and funds were not in favor. And um, amongst the key concerns raised were that pension fund pension reform is in progress, that it would create an administrative burden, that we have current high indebted levels in South Africa, and that there would be heightened expectations. On the pension reform pr process that is in progress, we do know that National Treasury, Industry and Labor are in discussion on pension reform, and, the, and this bill is not part of that process. Um, my response to that would be that it doesn't have to be part of that process. Um, there is the conversation going on about whether members would be able to access a um, early withdrawal with tax relief on it, etc. That's part of the conversation. Um, but my, I'm specifically focusing for now on being able to leverage, a member being able to leverage their own money for their own benefit during a time when they need it to exercise freedom of choice. The administrative burden, the argument is that fund administrators would be required to expand their administration to facilitate the loans. This, of course, would depend on where the loans were offered. The, 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 the bill does not force funds to offer it, and many funds do not offer home loans at the moment, but some do. At the same time, any change does present opportunities. So there are possible opportunities for service providers to develop a different model. We do know that the industry does have some big players in it. It is a profitable industry as far as I understand it. The fees are charged on funds are not um, insignificant. Um, so if loans, also very importantly, is that if loans were not restricted only to home loans, the administration process would be easier. Because at the moment, if it is restricted only to a home loan, there is an additional step of paperwork that needs to happen, i.e. proof that this loan is in fact for a house or for a home improvement. Now we do know from the industry is that there are times when members do all sorts of gymnastics so that they can actually get around that restriction. Um, so by not restricting the loan, you would not have that hurdle to climb over and would be less administratively burdensome in that instance. Um, the argument that members are already highly indebted well, of course, the National Credit Act imposes restrictions. I'm not proposing that the act would fall away. I'm proposing that um, I hear some noise going on there in the background. Um, I'm not proposing that the National Credit Act wouldn't wouldn't obviously apply. Um, but the simple fact is, is that although there are many members who are over indebted, possibly or indebted to the max, not everybody is over indebted. So that argument cannot be that everybody's in the same boat, they are not. 
Not everybody is over indebted. And also something while I was doing my slides that I thought of is that, for example, if you have people who have borrowed money at very high rates, for example, we know what uh, extremely high rates people get charged on short term loans, for example, that perhaps this creates an opportunity for debt consolidation. So, for example, if somebody's paying an excess amount of interest, for example, on loans, that perhaps their pension fund could be leveraged in some way that would give them the benefit of a, a softer interest on, on, on existing debt. I mean, I haven't thought it through, but that sounds like a possibility. Um, heightened expectations. Um, there is a, a concern that members would feel aggrieved if the fund did not offer loans because the law allowed it, but the fund can decide not to that members might feel aggrieved if they didn't qualify for a loan, because if the fund does allow it, doesn't mean that they can, because the financial institution would decide whether they would qualify. Um, and as in anything in life, I think expectations would need to be managed. Um, so um, in conclusion, that this bill is not a silver bullet. It is not designed to solve the economic crisis or financial woes of, 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 of South Africa. I mean, we have very serious economic problems as we know. Um, however, in my view, it is a step in the right direction. Not every fund will offer loans. Not everyone will qualify for a loan, but some will. And this will enable a member to leverage their own asset to their own benefit. So the question is that should members be able to leverage their own financial asset for their own benefit? And my bill says yes, and so do I. Um, thank you, Chair. That concludes my presentation and I apology for, apologize for the difficulties I was experiencing. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. George, for your presentation. Uh, let's invite members who would like to ask uh, clarity seeking questions and uh, make comments. Over to you, honorable members. Alan, you will assist me from your side to identify members who like to. So ask clarity seeking questions and make comments. Uh, yes, Chair, for now there's no one. Um, yeah, even from my side, I can't see any member who would like to make a comment. Uh, Treasury, do you want to make any comment? not in a manner that influences the decision-making. Decision-making is ours. But at the end, remember, you are the lead department to uh, uh, implement this kind of an act. I mean, if this becomes an act of parliament, if ever there is any comment that you would like to make, and as I've said, not in a, member to, in a manner to influence the outcome of the decision-making. But uh, you are a very important stakeholder because the, the act will come to you at the end of the day. Yeah, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, Chair, we, we, uh, you know, we, we do have a detailed presentation, but not for today, uh, as soon as you have hearings. I think that you know, for us, the issue is that the biggest problem we have is South Africans don't save enough, and we need to be careful not to throw the baby out of with the bathwater. Uh, the point is that uh, South Africans are highly indebted. And, you know, in a sense, your retirement savings are what's forced on you because when you're employed uh, through the collective bargaining and other arrangements, you're forced to put aside some money towards your pension. Our problem and the retirement reforms that we started in 2011 a design, I think, to deal with many problems because the biggest problem is members actually don't preserve their funds and th there's gaps like they resign. As soon as they resign, they cash their money out. Um, and so the broader reform is really, um, whilst we think that there is a, a role for some limited withdrawals, 
the bigger issue is to get preservation so people don't cash out each time they change jobs, uh, to close that loophole. Um, and I think that just on the borrowing side, there's also been a lot of abuse for those funds that allow it. I think Honorable George has touched on that. And whilst we're not close to options, I think we have been in talking to NEDLEC engaging. And I can, I, one thing we've realized is there's no easy way out of this. And I think that the bill actually will invite more problems. Uh, and there's a number of considerations and we are very happy to go through it in detail uh, when we come and present chair. But there, we have big concerns on the bill from that perspective. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Momo, for your comments. As we have said that uh, at the right time, uh, Treasurer will be allowed to come and make a, a submission in this regard. Uh, that's that. Unless Dr. George would like to make a closing comment on this presentation before we move to the next one. Um, no, Chair, I do look forward to the interactions that we're going to have in the future, because it is true, as the Treasury said, I mean, it's, this is not a simple matter. And the whole issue of pension fund reform is not simple. That is why it's taken so long. But I think what is very good, I think, irrespective of where we end up with this bill, is that the matter is, in fact, brought closer to the forefront, because it does need to be done. And I'm very happy that I'm part of that process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Treasurer. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. George. Uh, let's move to item six, briefing by Honorable e. Lewis on the Fiscal Responsibility Bill B5 2020. Over to you, Honorable Lu e. Lewis. Thank you very much. Chairman and committee members, it's really such a pleasure to be able to do this today. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see my screen now, Chair? Yes, we can see the screen. You can proceed. Great. So this is a briefing on the Fiscal Responsibility Bill, uh, as you've said, Bill 5 of 2020. Uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to present it to the committee today. Firstly, what does the bill do? The bill introduces for the first time in South Africa a statutory fiscal rule, uh, which is sometimes also called a fiscal anchor in some parts of the world. And uh, a fiscal rule is, a, or a legislated fiscal rule, is a, a, a budgetary rule which every government uh, has to comply with, uh, which incentivizes or requires responsible budgeting behavior. This particular bill is aimed specifically at national debt. You get different kinds of fiscal rules. Sometimes you get a balanced budget rule, you get debt ceilings uh, like in America. And this one is particularly aimed at containing national debt and debt service costs. Now you may ask, why do I focus on debt? Well, it's because debt is the most tempting thing for any government. Every government in the world uh, faces relentless political pressure to spend more. And in recent days, we've seen even in South Africa, this, this government is still under enormous pressure to spend more all the time on student debt, on student fees, uh, on bailouts for companies, on higher social grants, on a basic income grant, on, on vaccines and... Uh, and so on, the, the, the pressures to spend are almost never ending. And that's not unique to South Africa at all. That is almost every democratic government in the world faces this enormous temptation uh, to spend more than they should, to spend more than they, uh, beyond their means. And over time, this, this results in a debt trap. And that's exactly what's happened in South Africa over the last decade. Each year, we've just gone a little bit further and further into debt. And then you wake up a decade later and you, and you have a major debt crisis. Uh, and this is not a comment, Chairperson, on, on the current government. This actually applies to all governments, uh, present and future. We should want every democratically elected government in South Africa to, to behave responsibly with debt 
uh, and to not allow debt to become the useful tool of, of political pressure in society. Uh, so the, the temptation is always for a government to borrow more now because they don't have to sort out the borrowing later. So you can always leave the problem to a future government, to a future finance minister, and ultimately to future South Africans, to future generations of people to pay off with higher taxes. So debt is, debt is like a drug in, in society because it is, uh, you know, it's so easy to make it someone else's problem. And that is why it's so tempting. Uh, and that is why uh, it's, it's useful to have a legislated fiscal rule to, to help stop that. And as I say, this is for all governments, present and future. Right. The idea of a legislated fiscal rule is an idea whose time has come, uh, Mr. Chair. If you look across the globe, statutory fiscal rules are increasingly being adopted everywhere. Even our own neighbors, Namibia and Botswana, have got legislated fiscal rules. And I've just selected a few countries that are, I think, relevant to our comparison, but actually there are many more, and I'm happy to provide a full list of, of, of countries who have adopted some form of fiscal rule, like Brazil, Mexico, Canada, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Australia. Many of those are middle-income countries exactly like us, similar social spending pressures, similar poverty pressures, uh, and, and similar problems with debt sustainability. The OECD has, has recommended that, uh, that countries should adopt fiscal rules. And they've said in, in a 2019 paper on fiscal rules that well-designed fiscal rules appear decisive in fostering long-term growth. So actually, fiscal rules are helpful to growing the economy because it gives everyone confidence that, uh, that fiscal policy will be more responsible in the future. And I've been pursuing this idea since... Uh, even Minister Mbaweni has said in 2018 that, uh, and he called it a fiscal anchor, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. New fiscal anchors may be required to ensure the sustainability of South Africa's uh, fiscus, in addition to the expenditure ceiling. So we already have a kind of, of uh, fiscal rule in South Africa, but it's a very loose fiscal rule uh, called the expenditure ceiling. Uh, and so this is a proposal for a new fiscal rule aimed uh, specifically at debt. Ah. Now, I was thrilled to see the response from the Treasury in last week's presentation or two weeks ago's presentation, and I've included their slide in full because it is uh, basically in, you know, there's very little on the slide that I disagree with, and it is basically in support of the principle of a fiscal rule. Uh, and I will just focus on those last bullet points. Introduction of a new fiscal law to be passed in Parliament in order to make it binding. That law must include escape clauses for extraordinary unforeseen events, like a multi-year recession or, for example, COVID. Uh, and that is basically exactly what this bill does. It also says that a fiscal rule must be clear and credible. Uh, and one option would be to introduce a debt ceiling. As I've said, I focus on uh, e essentially a debt rule. Okay. Let me just say a word about the scale of South Africa's debt crisis. And to quote the minister from his budget speech, we owe a lot of people a lot of money. I think that's a, a very simple but powerful line. Uh, if you look at the, by the end of the current MTF, South Africa will be five, nearly five and a half trillion rand in debt. Uh, in two years' time, or in the, at the end of the MTF, we will spend 338.5 billion rand every year just on interest. That will be 60 billion rand more than we spend on basic education, 80 billion rand more than we spend on health, 90 billion rand more than we spend on social grants. That will be triple our total police budget and seven times our total defense budget just on paying interest on our loans. It will be the biggest single item on the budget bar public salaries. So for years, uh, we have warned and many people have warned of this idea of squeezing out, crowding out basic services and basic expenditure. 
And for years, the Treasury has done a kind of miracle job in preventing that from happening. But this year, really, we saw for the first time very real cuts to basic services like social grants, health care, uh, and emergency services. And so what we've seen coming, the train that we've seen coming down the track for years has eventually arrived where it is no longer possible to continue to pay debt and continue to support all of the social services that you want. Uh, sorry, to, to continue to pay the interest on in your debt. And so we've seen the one crowd out the other. And that has led uh, an extraordinary statement by the FFC in our committee, uh, which we all heard, questioning whether the, the budget is in fact constitutional. Now, regardless of whether we agree or disagree with that view, the point I'm making is that we have reached the point where interest expenditure is now fundamentally undermining our commitment to social justice and to caring for the poor and most vulnerable in our society. That cannot continue. So if, if our current growth, revenue, and debt targets are met, and I say that that is a very big if, then debt will stabilize at 89% of GDP in, uh, 20, in 2025. Now, just to give you an idea, the IMF recommends that a healthy or sustainable level of debt to GDP for middle-income countries like ourselves is around 50%. So we are already nearly 40 percentage points or we will be nearly 40 percentage points above what is considered healthy and sustainable for a country of our income and even now as we face this situation where we are spending so much on interest where we have relentlessly made the point and the government and treasury has relentlessly made the point about the danger that we face and how this expenditure is squeezing out all of the essential things that we should be spending money on, we still face massive political pressure to spend more. And we even have this, um, this kind of faux debate uh, around whether South Africa faces austerity or not. So still, there is just a relentless pressure to spend more. And that is why I really believe that this bill, the fiscal responsibility bill, can actually be an asset to any government. Because at least now, it removes some of the discretion around going deeper and deeper into debt from the government. And you can almost fall back on the legislation as, uh, as a reason why it is, it is simply not possible to go deeper into debt year after year after year. So it could actually be helpful. Okay. Then the specifics of what, what this bill does. Firstly, it introduces a debt to GDP rule. The, the bill provides for a fiscal rule prescribing that for each financial year, consolidated net loan debt expressed as a percentage of GDP must not be higher than it was the previous year. And I want to say up front that this does not mean that the government cannot borrow. One of the objections, one of the uh, less informed objections I've heard is that this would stop the government from borrowing. No, that is not the case. As, as there are redemptions, the government is obviously able to, to roll over those redemptions. And as the economy grows, of course, that means that the, de the denominator in that uh, in that calculation, debt to GDP grows. Therefore, debt can grow too. So it does not stop the government from borrowing. All it does is say that the net loan debt as a percentage of GDP should not grow. Two, a rule on government guarantees. The bill provides for a fiscal rule prescribing that for each financial year, aggregated government guarantees should not be more than they were in the previous year. That's self-explanatory. Three, it provides for a regular review. The bill provides for a review of the fiscal rules by the National Assembly, essentially by this committee, every four years by either amending, renewing, or terminating the fiscal rules by way of an amendment bill. I think it's important that it gives the National Assembly proper oversight power over the government's fiscal responsibility. I think that's a great feature of the, of the bill. 
And then as the Treasury said in their slide that I put up earlier, of course, there has to be a provision for emergencies and unforeseen circumstances. So the bill provides for an exemption from the fiscal rule to be granted by the National Assembly on application from the Finance Minister with good cause having been shown and with the support of, of the uh, Standing Committee on Finance, this committee. So if there is a, another COVID, uh, last year we borrowed 779 billion Rand, and it's difficult to see how we couldn't do that in a, in a, uh, in a crisis year. So if, that, if something similar happens, God forbid again, then this bill provides for the, for the finance minister to apply for an exemption to the fiscal rule with the support of this committee. And finally, the bill requires the Minister of Finance to table an annual fiscal responsibility report at the same time as, as the tabling of the budget, setting out whether the fiscal rules were complied with or not, and the reasons therefore. Those are the five main things that the bill does, uh, honorable colleagues. Now, let me just deal with the, the one of the common objections I've heard. I've already dealt with one around, around stopping government from borrowing. This idea that it unfairly limits uh, or constrains government's fiscal policy. Uh, what I would say is that the key tool of fiscal policy is actually uh, tax revenue, not debt. Of course, debt is important and it should be used to fund investment, but fiscal policy space can still expand significantly with economic growth because growth leads to more revenue. And growth is strongly correlated, as Treasury has often made this case in our committee, growth is strongly correlated with sustainable debt path. So actually, by controlling debt, you can encourage growth, which expands fiscal space. Uh, and so I would flip this objection on its head and say, actually, this bill helps to expand fiscal space by underpinning proper sustainable growth. More than that, the, one of the explicit points, the one of the explicit point uh, objectives of the bill is to limit any government's ability, present governments or future governments, to engage in irresponsible behavior or profligate borrowing with allowances for emergencies. And again, South Africa's growth is, South Africa's economic growth right now is inhibited by our uh, unsustainable debt trajectory and escalating perceptions of risk attached to our debt in global markets. So this actually helps address that problem and helps the economy grow, which increases fiscal space. Uh, there's a growing body of, of research on this, and, uh, and I'm happy to, to recommend a lot of it to honorable members who may want to read about it. But, but the, I did find one very interesting paper, which actually argues that far from uh, constraining fiscal space if anything, the fiscal rules that have generally been adopted are too weak to have any constraining effect. And that is clear to see in the American example. The USA has a debt ceiling fiscal rule. And every nearly every year, uh, you know, Congress finds a reason to, to increase the debt ceiling. Uh, and so we have to be careful that it's not just a, uh, it's not just a, meaningless uh, fiscal rule that it actually has some bite to it and and th that is the subject covered in this paper but even if it is uh, symbolic it is a nevertheless a very important symbol or signal that the government is absolutely absolutely committed to fiscal responsibility and debt sustainability Uh, Chairman, the, just to conclude, what does this bill help South Africa do? It helps get our national debt under control. It will help to restore confidence in South Africa's economy. It will help to restore our sovereign credit rating. And it will help to ensure that future generations are not hobbled with trillions of rands in debt, higher taxes, and lower growth. It will help to stop a full-blown sovereign debt crisis with government unable to find new lenders, and it will help to stop a loss of sovereignty
to international lending institutions. For that reason, I think it is a bill that we should be proud of. I'm certainly proud of it and, and that we should support. And I recommend it to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, thanks, Honorable De Lewis, for your presentation on the Fiscal Responsibility Bill. Uh, honorable members, uh, we can engage uh, with the presentation from Honorable E. Lewis. Uh, questions for clarity, uh, comments. Alan, you will assist me with uh, members who might be on the platform and I cannot see them from my side. Um, to hey. identify. Yes, chairs, nobody uh, yet. Okay. Are there members who would like to ask clarity seeking questions or make comments in regard to the fiscal responsibility bill? Okay, so now they are not there. Uh, Treasury, is there any comment that you would like to make in regard to this bill? Uh, Chair Edgar Sishi from the Budget Office, I, I can come in if you permit me. You are welcome, Mr. Sishi. So thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. So, um, yeah, just a few comments. Um, as uh, Honorable Hill Lewis indicated, we, we do have um, and have had for some years um, a fiscal rule in South Africa, uh, which is uh, the spending ceiling. But of course, it's not it's not a it's not a law. It's a um, it's a uh, it's a, it's a guideline, and it is true that it has weakened over time. Hence, um, um, some of the reflections and. Um, actions that we've taken in in the last uh, two budgets since budget 2020. Um, but so that's an example of another kind of fiscal rule where you have um, a spending ceiling, um, which is currently a guide. This uh, bill obviously proposes a statutory arrangement. There is um, um, another a thing that has become a kind of a de facto fiscal rule. And by de facto, I mean, it's not it's become incidental to the fiscal realities of South Africa, and that's the financing um, um, arrangements. We uh, have a, a rule around how we borrow in foreign currency versus how much we borrow in foreign currency versus what we borrow in local currency. Um, and um, uh, to the extent that debt has become a bigger part of uh, how government funds its spending, um, this year, 88% of government spending is being financed by taxes. Um, the other 12% is, is, is debt in the current year. And that, of course, accumulates, and that's accumulated over the years. Um, to the extent that that's the case, the fact that we have a rule that obligates us to borrow mostly in local currency has protected us from, um, um, from exchange rate risks um, and other similar um, risks. But so that's become a kind of a de facto rule, but it is, it still comes back to the fact that its importance is only a testament of the fact that debt is so much bigger um, than it was uh, before. Um, secondly, um, just to also remind honorable members that uh, fiscal rule uh, can be important, but it does not replace the need for basic fiscal discipline. Um, um, in other words, you have to improve your fiscal marksmanship, if I can put it that way, um, hitting the targets that you set in the budget. And the fiscal rule does not replace that and can't replace that. Indeed, um, if you have a statutory fiscal rule um, and you miss your fiscal targets, the consequences in terms of confidence and sentiment can be worse than if you didn't have uh, the rule in the first place. So that's important that it doesn't replace the need to make sure that 
fiscal discipline um, is, is maintained. Um, the next point is that um, the rules should take into account, um, any rules should take into account, uh, the fact that the economic cycle will turn. In other words, um, if you set a rule um, on anything, whether it's on debt, whether it's on spending, um, or, or, or the, 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 the primary balance or the fiscal balance, and um, 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 the economic cycle turns from a downturn to an upturn. In other words, the econo economy starts to grow, tax revenue um, improves. Um, there is a temptation to spend up to the limit that you had set before. So you have to have a mechanism for managing that risk of uh, thinking about the, the economic cycle in an, in an upturn rather than a downturn, because a, a rule under, under that's badly designed can um, promote um, pro-cyclicality. And then my penultimate point is to just indicate that uh, one of the things that we, it, we consider, and we've made this point in our own presentations, um, is the fact that the composition of spending in South Africa, uh, and indeed in a number of countries around the world, but certainly in South Africa, this is quite clear, um, that the composition of spending is to some extent a function of the protections that certain items of spending enjoy versus other items of spending. So for instance, um, there are um, very strong institutional protections um, uh, for consumption spending, um, particularly the wage bill, uh, but there's no institutional protections for, for instance, infrastructure spending or maintenance. Indeed, when there is pressure on the wage bill, um, budget managers typically take money from maintenance of infrastructure in order to pay the salaries. And I'm raising that point, honorable chair and honorable members, to indicate the fact that um, you, you, you have to be aware of an unintended consequence where when you have a rule in place and people know that there's a global rule that must be met, that they use the unprotected elements of spending to shift funds so that they can stay within. And, that's, and, and that means you've, you, 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 you've almost put the cart before the horse in the sense that there is this problem of institutional protections that has to be addressed uh, at the same time that, that you are implementing um, rules. And then finally, my last comment, Chair, is to just indicate that um, we have had reflections, discussions, and documents that we've written on some kind of fiscal anchors for quite a long time. These conversations have happened on and off. Um, I remember seeing um, documents, discussions um, in Parliament on this subject as far back as 2009. Um, uh, so this is a subject that, that's not new, it's come up uh, from time to time. One of the things that we have consistently indicated is that um, in order to build the credibility of any rule and the lesson that we've learned from the challenges that we've experienced with the rules that we have had in place is that you need fairly strong institutional arrangements. And in our presentation last week and in the slide that Honorable Hill Lewis showed, we did indicate in one of the points that we consider that um, if, 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 if one goes in that route, you have to have some kind of institutional protections of the rules that you're putting in place. Um, um, uh, and you have to satisfy yourself that they can be um, utilized both in terms of its implementation, but more than that, advice on when changes uh, may uh, need uh, to be made. Uh, that's not part of this bill, but that is an element that we have uh, included in our previous uh, discussions. Those are very general comments, uh, Chair. Of course, uh, uh, I've tried to keep to your instruction that we don't say anything that's designed to influence decisions. It's just broad comments. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks, um, Mr. Sishi, for your comments. Honorable uh, Lewis, any closing comment before we move uh, thank to you, the Thank you, Chairman. I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that uh, Mr. Sishi has confirmed that this matter has been under discussion and consideration uh, since 2009. I am shocked to hear. Uh, I only wish we had done something about it then when, when debt was at 20% of GDP. Uh, and and we could have been saved if the, the, 
debt crisis we we have now but there's no time like the present and uh there's it's never too late to do the right thing so let's let's get on and 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 do this now 10 years later or 12 years later but nevertheless uh let's get a, let's get on and do it now thank you okay thanks honorable louis uh, we are done with uh, all the items. Uh, we are moving towards closure. Are there announcements, Secretary? Alan, is there uh, an, any announcement? Uh, no, Chair, just uh, tomorrow's meeting, uh, PRC and AO and Independent Group and uh, Mr. Maponia. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, honorable members, uh, officials from Treasury, uh, Reserve Bank, uh, and other stakeholders who were in attendance, and uh, officials of uh, Parliament, um, and uh, all members uh, present. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, until we meet tomorrow uh, at nine o'clock, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. You are welcome. <laughs>